La Rosalier. Is that how you said you pronounce it? Oh, man. Right? Yeah. yeah. I think I'm not looking at it right now, but if La I recall. La Rosalier. Yes. Um, Steve. Steve La Rosalier, I think yeah. is what he said, uh, is on the podcast today. Um, interesting conversation. Mm. Uh, I feel like Nick was stunned with some very simple information that was bestowed <laughs> upon him. You're making me sound like an idiot. I, I, and that's feel okay. like I feel like you're above this. It, it was you know like, what? It was a lot. So it was a lot about marketing, which I feel like I have a pretty good grasp on. But after today's episode, I actually feel like I might be overthinking it. I think you might be overthinking it <clears throat> and overthinking. Well, I tend to do that. Um, but I mean, such an interesting career too. He started out in nonprofit. He was involved in the X Games, uh, and then essentially, you know, he said he married into the the uh, a family that was woodworkers and builders and developers, and saw this need for you know kind of marketing support in that space. Um, and you know, what was the mo- oh that's what the that's what it was that he blew my mind is when he talked about how he started his business yeah and he, why and he he surveyed a bunch of people asking like what do you what what is one thing that you wish you had help on and based on that he started that business and it was just that that whole mindset of why he started the business and how is so different than i think a lot of us uh ever approach business we, we think about what we want to be doing and you know and i mean definitely including myself like i oftentimes force what I want to into the market to see if it sticks. Um, and as I say that out loud, I'm like, Oh my gosh, like there's a lot of, trying to, to, <laughs> what, there's a lot I'm trying to force. Yeah, but um, Steve recently had a, a career switch and left uh, his, his baby that he created, which was a nonprofit um, for the sake of doing something else. And it's a classic case of you started something for, every reason that you love it and then as the business grows you're pulled further and further away from that and everything that you're doing couldn't be further from the passion Mm -hmm. that you had for this in the first place and realize that there was no way out um except for to leave you know there, there was no changing the path the trajectory at that point so he he got boots on the ground and started small and is in the beginning stages of growing this new business and this new brand. And he talks a little bit about that. So I hope you guys enjoy this one. Um, interesting conversation. Like I said, Steve's an interesting dude and uh, I appreciate all the insight. This podcast is brought to you by Anderson. When making decisions on the product you spec, we're always thinking about what's right for the customer and what the specific project's needs are. We're also thinking about our reputation, and Anderson knows that the product they manufacture are part of the legacy that we're all trying to build. From Fibrex, composite material that delivers performance and looks at a budget-friendly price point to the Easy Connect reinforced joining system that makes it easier to assemble oversized window walls with less people to Anderson's best-performing A-Series product line with the most energy-efficient windows and doors Anderson has ever offered. Whatever your building needs are, they've got you covered. Anderson knows it's about fewer callbacks and products that will perform over time. That's why they test test and test their products beyond the threshold required by the industry. Anderson appreciates that. While it may be their products going into our projects, it's ultimately our brands that we're building. And they're proud to be helping us craft our legacies. Learn more about their product offering at andersonwindows.com. So how do you become the GC every sub wants to work with? Get on board with construction management software like Builder Trend. The platform gives subs access to an online portal where they can view a project schedule, send your team a message, and participate in the bidding process. That is convenient. It makes their job easier, increases the chance they'll choose to work with you again on future projects. So to see more about Build a Trend sub portal in action and learn how you can go from it's complicated to hashtag relationship goals with every sub you hire, go to buildertrend.com forward slash MC demo and schedule a call with their team. What's it called? The Woodpreneur Podcast. The Woodpreneur? Yeah, yeah. My podcast is called The Woodpreneur Podcast. Nice. What? Yeah. Tell me a little more about that. I, I looked that up. You have a lot going on. <laughs> yeah so i just have a podcast i record three times a week it used to be one time a week 
And then I coach and I mentor woodpreneurs. So woodworkers, lumber, sawyer, furniture makers. Yeah. And then, you know, there's the community aspect of like groups and, and then when I get on a plane, if I go to a city, then I'll host an event there. But that that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. I, I work with woodpreneurs. How'd you get involved in that? So I came, uh, background was, uh, I'm a marketer and then I ran a nonprofit for 18 years. I'd help my father-in-law with his sawmill business. And about seven years ago, I wanted to start a new business. So instead of coming up with an idea myself, uh, I decided to create a business based off of the passions of other people. And, uh, I found that people that work with wood are irrationally passionate and obsessive. And so <laughs> I decided to just start working with those folks. Uh, and then they, their number one challenge was, uh, nobody knew that they, they existed. And so that's kind of how I got into it. I just, so I've been in it for about seven years. Um, and my specialty, even before I did started working with the wood industry was I'm a big snowboarder and skateboarder and. I was passionate about that. And then I started, I was also big into mentoring kids and I wanted a way to combine my passions for mentoring and snowboarding, skateboarding and surfing. So I started a snowboard. I started an action sports mentoring organization. So big brothers, big sisters. So mm. I've kind of always been like this little outsider going into industries and either diversifying it or helping to make it better. Um, help I like helping people. I'm a big, I'm a big, uh, supporter of businesses and entrepreneurship. So how does the, uh, the podcast and the woodpreneur, how, like, what's that business model? What's actually making you money? So coaching, consulting folks, growing them, growing businesses. So, you know, it's like just consulting and I use the podcast as a, um, lead generator audience builder, you know, that sort of stuff. So what are, what are like the, the deliverables for you when somebody comes to you and wants to grow their woodworking business? Because I'm sure it's different than, uh, you know, a larger, more corporate type of business. So yeah. Like most, most people who come to you, what are they looking for? On a very simple level, it's like, they want to change their mind to actually believe that they could grow their business. Yeah. And they have a business. Uh, but other than that, it's like, I help, uh, do advertising, paid advertising into their business. So setting up the ads, um, help come up with their offer, their product, their pricing strategies. We also help them with, uh, developing content, creating the right style of content, mm. um, auditing their website, SEO, designing logos, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, but I've also did the same thing with corporations. So I worked with, uh, wood miser. I did some consulting with them. I did with, uh, Granberg Alaskan chainsaw with them. Uh, most recently I just finished up working with I dry vacuum kilns. I helped them go from seven to eight figures. Um, by installing marketing systems into their business, automation, building out their content, you know, that sort of stuff. So do you feel that uh, there's a big difference between working for those larger companies and the, the smaller um, woodworking people? Yeah, for sure. So I think the biggest thing is helping smaller uh, businesses realize that the way they invest in tools is the way they need to invest in their mm. marketing businesses. Um, and that's kind of been the real, the biggest thing It's like, you can hand saw or you can use like a table saw, right? Um, you could only rely on word of mouth or you could put together a strategy to create content or, you know, maybe you can advertise in your local newspaper or you can leverage Facebook, right? Like there, there's just all these different levels. Um, but like I said, in the beginning, the biggest thing has been just helping people to think bigger 
than what they, you know, I just had this thought the other day, I was talking to somebody, it's like the same process in which you either, whether it's you build a house or you renovate or, you know, you make furniture, that same brain that says like, okay, I need this to be perfect. Things need to line up Mm -hmm. the same exact way in order for me to like produce this outcome. Because if you get your measurements wrong, you do everything's wrong. So you have to like measure twice, cut once and do all these things. It's not the same thing with marketing and growing sales in your business. It's like, it's a different brain. And so what I try to tell people is like, you don't have to be perfect when it comes to marketing. You just have to do it. And you don't have to be perfect when it comes to sale. You just have to do more of it. Um, so anyway, that's, that's essentially it. Does that, does that help? Or Yeah. Are, mo- are most of, uh, from like the woodworker end of things are most of your clients hobbyists that are looking to make more money or potentially go full time or what, what's that like client makeup look like? It's more of, uh, the latter people that have full time businesses, but they're looking at you know, get past six figures. And then, you know, we have people in the mid six figures that are looking to get to seven figures. I do my best not to work with hobbyists. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine that that would be a relatively (laughs) tough market where it's like, I don't have money for anything, let alone paying somebody to market. Yeah. It's that's, that's the hard part. Well, honestly, the other, the other thing is like, I think when you're beginning, you need to actually do the work and, like Mm -hmm. fail and just go through the motions before you even understand or have the thought that like, Oh, I think I need help. And so oftentimes like you, you can pop into any woodworking group and people like I made this, it's like $150 and I put 50 hours of work into it. Like I don't, you know, and so it's just, it's hard. However, I mean, with that said, I did help about eight people quit their jobs and go full time. Like people that were like, this was side hustle. They wanted to go full time. Mm. I have helped. I have helped some folks go from um, side hustle to to full time. So what do you, what do you think is the lacking the most? So most of our listenership is going to be remodelers, builders. Uh, We may have a handful of larger, companies but i think that a lot of the people are smaller smaller businesses or work for a moderately sized business what do you feel is lacking the most um from that perspective from like a marketing standpoint so it's just a clear understanding of who you are what you do uh your pricing um And when people oftentimes tell me like, I don't have leads, I don't have leads. And then you look at how they're currently positioning themselves in the marketplace, like nothing really lines up, right? They don't have the logo. They don't have the website. They don't, they're not getting back to people on time. Like their, their whole system is not, it's not congruent with the results that they want. And, um, and again, I, you know, this is like the third time I'm saying it, it was like, they just have to have like more of an abundance mindset. Like it's not about competition. It's you. Mm-hmm. It's not about the economy. It's you. It's not about the president. It's not about Congress. It's you. Right. And so if you, if you play and act like a business and all of your behaviors are towards the key metrics, how many leads, Mm. how many quotes and proposals you put out and how many sales, right? Like those, those are the things that, that matter, uh, the most. I'm, uh, I'm looking up your builder growth IO website. Um, and, uh, hold on, before we go down that, that side of it, the metrics that you just kind of rattled off, you know, Mm -hmm. that's something that, um, I've struggled with where mm-hmm. from a marketing perspective, we do, we have an abundance of content. We, yes. we do a ton of video, a ton of photo. Like we do a lot with social media. Um, yes. But recently, not recently, I, I guess forever, we've never really had this like 
clear, clear strategy. It was just, let's create content, create awareness. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's just been, and, and truthfully, I feel looking back at it, that it's just been like an army crawl on the ground where it's like, yeah. we're just, we're, we're continually building content. We're sharing it. You know, we've obviously amassed, you know, a great following and all, all of those great things. But then it's a matter of, yeah, sure. All of my leads come through social media. Like all of the projects that we get are either solidified on social media or they came from social media. But I don't have an abundance of qualified projects. I have an abundance yeah. of leads, but not of an abundance of qualified projects. And when we t had Spencer Powell on the podcast, we were talking about this. Uh, mm -hmm. And I went down this rabbit hole of just like re-looking at our marketing strategy and chatted with him offline and then started digging into, you know, what you just said, some of these metrics. Um, mm -hmm. And I forget it, it. There's like this. I forget. It's like 100 to 1 rule that APB posted yesterday. And it talks yeah. about like, you know, 100, um, 100 leads equal like 20 prospects, like and went down in, 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 in one contract. Uh, yeah. And when it was when it was visualized like that, it's like, man, that's when you realize how yeah. many leads that you need or that you're getting that actually turn into an actual sale. It's a lot. And it's furthermore, lot. to your point, it's that that that's either further solidifying the whole uh, uh, idea that you need to have this abundance of of content and marketing where, yeah. you know, I love what you said. It's not about the economy. It's not about it, your competition. It's about you. And, you know, anyone that's listening to this probably, you know, felt that in the sense that, yeah. you know what, like, I guess, I guess he's right, you know, yeah. and it's in, yeah. I, you know, I think about, I, I think about it quite a bit where it's, you know, I was talking to a builder that's local and he's like, yeah, we just, we looked at another project yesterday, you know, that one's 15 million. And then we were looking at this one and that one's 13 million. And uh, oh, that one. Yeah. I think it's like somewhere around 18 million. I'm like, there's that many yeah. that, that you have three of them to, like today. It's wild. And, yeah, and, and, yeah. and that can, and, and I'm, I'm using those numbers because for me, like those are, those aren't projects that we're doing. Yeah. And, you know, and then you, and, and you, any of us can, can relate to the fact that it's like, well, what happened? Like, you know, yeah, I'm getting a slowdown in leads or like, there's not as much work out there and, you know, the economy is slowing down. It's like, is it, or are you just putting less effort? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's wild when you think about it too. Cause like, even in my little agency consulting, you know, it all depends on, People's like, you know, people check in, you're like, how's your month going? I'm like, I'm crushing it. My calendar's full, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, other people like it, it takes an enormous amount of uh, energy to put out there. Mm. And I just said this to, you know, a group of clients the other day. I was like, current, the, the modern currency right now is consistency. Mm. Like, however, <laughs> however consistent you can be in your life and in your business, the, the more that you will see the, 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 the results of those efforts, like it's just consistent. I like, you know, even for myself, I like look back at last month, it, it, it went from potentially being like the worst month to the, to the best month of the year. And I look back at my output. I was like, okay, I sent more emails. I did more posts. I had more calls like, and then each one kind of leads to the other. And, you know, I've had clients that have had their best month and this happens. And I know you guys could, it's like, you're busy. You've had a great month. You got a lot of deposits. And the thing that got you to that at that month, the next month is slow because oftentimes you just didn't continue doing it because right. you got overwhelmed thinking, yeah. oh my God, if I'm so busy right now, I can't keep this up. Yeah. Turn the water off. Turn the water off. Exactly. Sink exactly. dries up. It's like now you're. Just, I, and now I you're always dry. tell people like, don't take your foot off the gas. Yeah. What you actually need to do is put a resource in place in order to manage that. You put mm -hmm. some processes, you put some systems. Um, yeah, and you can't. You literally can't do everything. So, just, specific to that, when you say put processes in place and and resources, are you talking about automate? 
automatic emails or or outsourcing content creation or like what what are some of the uh let's say like easier more adaptable things that anyone that's listening to this can not only understand but potentially even utilize right off the bat one of the things that i i do um so i like to tell i've been uh so before i i went full time on this running a nonprofit and I was doing this on the side. And so I'm coming up on two years of doing this, but the only way that I ran a national nonprofit with a staff of 20 people in three cities was that I, with this business, I built a, a team of virtual assistants. Um, and I, and I outsourced as much as, as I possibly could. Um, but yeah, if, if folks nowadays between Fiverr and Upwork and onlinejobs.ph, um, you know, you can you can literally build a, an administrative and a marketing army. That's one of the things that we do in my my business is that we like uh, recruit, screen, and train virtual marketing specialists to be placed into your business to act as you to you know book appointments, qualify leads, those, those first couple calls that you, you know, when you get a lead and you start texting them back and forth and emailing them back and forth to like, see whether it's worth getting onto a call, yeah. you know what I'm talking about, right? Like those could be outsourced. That mm -hmm. could be somebody um, that you're paying, you know, from the Philippines or, or if you have a stay at home mom or somebody that you can, you can build a team of people, um, but how do you qualify that person? So someone messages, someone fills out a form. They want to build a, a million dollar house. And I outsource this like initial interaction. I mean, give me the, give me the questions that you ask the first three questions that you ask somebody. I knew you were going to ask me that. And, then you're, <laughs> and you're going to be like, so they just asked that. Yeah. 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 I mean, so but what's they your can budget, where do you live? When are you looking to start? You know, and then are you working with an architect. Small. But, but then it can stop right there. I'm like, awesome. Let me get you on the phone with Nick. When are yeah. you available? And yeah. then you tell that person, I only talk to them on Wednesdays or Thursdays between this time and this time. And then they look at your calendar and book a time. And then two hours before the call, they're like, hey, um, you know, Johnny, Pro Jane Prospect, um, just confirming that, that you're going to be. I mean, you guys did that with me with this podcast yeah right like you have that and so yeah i feel like i mean between that so there, there's a so to answer your question what are some core activities that you don't want to do or don't have the time to do just make a list of those mm -hmm. things so the things that you have to do put it on the right side of the sheet of paper the things that you don't want to do or don't have to do put it on the left side and just write all of that stuff down and then build job descriptions and SOPs, standard operating procedures, mm -hmm. and create loom videos outlining all of that stuff. So, all right. I think the biggest, when I think about content creation and social media in our industry, the biggest gripe that people have with it is the actual creation of content. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to film video. I don't want to do video. I have photos that were shot by a photographer, but I can't use them. Or here's an mm -hmm. iPhone photo. How are you? How are you getting them over that? That is, um, so the, the the answer that I always tell people to that, I was like, I was like, you know, you know, when you drive on a highway and you see those billboards with the accident injury attorney. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was like, those people as cringy as they look 10 out of 10, they have to do it. Like, so, and if you happen to get into a truck accident, you're going to think of those people. I know the same thing with, uh, with real estate, you know, bus benches, like you just have to do it. And if people, and we live, you know, there, there's the, there's the, there's the, the conversation around short attention spans and social media and the way, like before you go to a restaurant, what's the first thing you're doing? You're checking out the reviews. You're looking at how many stars they have. 
That's mm-hmm. just the world that we live in. We have choices. And so um, if you are taking that for granted, then you're taking your business for granted. And if you're going to be so selfish to think that people are going to buy from you just because you can do a good job and that's it, like you're, you're not going to have a business because there's going to be somebody out there that's going to care more, that's going to put their name out more, that's going to help educate their customer more. It's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So what were you, what was your, uh, the nonprofit that you were working for prior to going off on your own? It's called Stoked. So S T O K E D stoked.org. Um, so yeah, so I founded that with, uh, uh, this guy named Salema Masakela. He used to host the, the X games. Yeah, I, was I, was say, I know that name. I know you guys know. I know you guys watch the X games. You must. Yeah. Watch um, so yeah, we founded it together. We wanted to find a way to help, uh, low income black and brown kids shred the gnar, you know? So, That's sick. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, why did you step away from that? I mean, I know that you started your own thing, but yeah, I, I stepped away from it because I did everything that I possibly could at the time it needed, it needed another, it needed somebody else to run it. So I hired my replacement and they're, they're running it now. So, yeah, I mean, and also too, I mean, it kind of speaks to, I don't know how you guys feel about business uh, as it relates to like, I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. You know, when you, you start off doing something and then as you grow, you have kids, you're like, you start looking at priorities and how you'd like to spend your time and. And so I wanted, I wanted to do something a little bit different that stretched my brain, got me exposed to, you know, I never thought I would be on a podcast with you guys, you know? And so, Mm. but if I was doing anything else, I, I would, I would never have met you, you know? So I like, I like context changing. I like, I like adding value to places, you know? And I felt like this, this space, I wanted to add value to it. So you were, you were doing the, um, consulting on the side yeah, while yes. you were doing that. Yeah. And did you, so when you, you left stoked and you, you hired a replacement, did you feel as it was a combination of, I can't handle both of these at once. I need a change. Or was it more so that the consulting was really starting to take off and you felt that that was where your time was better suited or what, like, what did that transition look like going from working for lack of a better term for a company to working for yourself, um, doing what you're doing now? Yeah. So, well, the, with Stoked, I founded it. So it was my organization. And so I, le- so I left there, um, because I felt like the momentum was with this consulting right now. Um, and then at the same time too, it was just like, I, I, I couldn't do both. I couldn't do both. It's like that kind of that realization too. Maybe it's called getting older. You realize you can't put a hundred percent of your attention on, on two, two, you know, two things. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of. That was, that was a good question. Yeah, for sure. It was like the momentum was there. And at the same time, I needed to, I needed to stop being nonprofit Stoke Steve. I needed to be Sawmill Woodpreneur Steve. So. And what, what do you feel is the biggest difference between those two people? Um, so it's interesting. That's a good question. Nobody's ever asked me that. Um, nonprofit Steve would literally pitch Mark Cuban on the, on the corner of 23rd and Madison and like just run through any walls to like, you know, provide opportunities for kids. And then Woodpreneur Steve is like working on this vision that, um, I actually don't even know what the end result will be, but I know ultimately it's about jobs, 
trees and like putting wood to good use like that's it, it's it's still evolving but like for me it's like i'm fascinated by this old industry and i love people that make stuff like i love builders and i'm a builder but i'm not a builder i'm a different type of builder but like i just love the building process i love the creating the creative process like I was always friends with artists and musicians and I mean, even athletes, athletes that builds, you know, they're building on tricks and that sort of stuff. But like, you know, watching my father-in-law just do construction, fascinating. My, I mean, he handed that skill off to my wife. She's renovating our house. Like we made the floors in our house. Like I just love the creation, the building process and I'm fascinated by it and I want to support. That's the energy that I want to be in. And I want to help grow that. So, and I mean, this, this may sound crazy, but you are attempting to grow a company that you don't understand where it's going and where that end goal is. And yes. if you were one of your own clients, I would assume that you would probably have them focus on some sort of a goal for where they want to be and what they want to do. Do you yeah. feel that your what you're doing with your business is counterintuitive to everything that you're probably doing running your business? Yes and no. No is that um, I know that I'm solving a problem for my clients. And so that's what my, my first challenge is, right? Like my, the first thing is like, I want to help clients grow their businesses, furniture, lumber, sawmill. As I continue to grow, I know ultimately that like, I may not always be in the consulting role. I may end up in a, you know, working with you guys or working, you know, having my own mill or having my own furniture, like, that's like, but where I'm at right now, I'm having a lot of fun helping people grow businesses. So like, you know, I look at my, my daily mantras and my, I'm like, I love helping growing wood businesses. Like, so for me, like I've had a lot of opportunities in my own life, but I, whenever I think about my clients and helping them grow their revenue. It's like, they're getting new trucks, they're going on vacations, they're expanding, they're getting new, like, that is exciting for me. That's, yeah. Does that make sense? Sure, yeah, I, um, I guess I'm just looking at it from like a marketing perspective and mm -hmm. for, for these smaller companies and businesses, and I feel as though it would be very important for them to have an idea of, of who they are and where they want to be yes. um and i think that it, it's it's a it's a very a lot of what we do is very um black and white but there there's a clear delineation between like what makes us money and what doesn't make us money yeah. um and it's interesting to hear that the person who's guiding them along that path and responsible for marketing them in a way that will yield the highest results has the business themselves where it's like, well, I don't really know what my end goal is where I want this to be. And yeah. I'm just trying to process that in my own head and rationalize that, which is probably me looking at this from a super rational perspective. And maybe that's not the way that your brain operates. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm not. A, yeah. That's, and that's what I was saying. I was like, remember before I was like builders have this, like you said, it's black and white. And so I come from a different brain. So like, for me, I, I know what I'm doing and I know what well, I know where I'm going and I know what the end goal is, but there's so many different opportunities that right now my business and the product and service that I'm doing for clients, uh, is, building and installing marketing systems into their business. That's what I do. Like people need brands, they need coaching, they need consulting. That's what I do. Is the coaching primarily marketing? 
that yeah marketing and then um uh and then eventually we're gonna move into operations like mm. streamlining operations but right now it's marketing branding lead generation and automation so w- am i correct me if i'm wrong but w- what you're talking about and all this stuff that you're putting into place for these companies mm-hmm. could could th- this is i mean your focus as a as a business in your brand the woodpreneur is primarily for woodworkers and, and people in the the wood related yes. industry but Correct. could i could you argue and say that what you're implementing could be attributed to any industry it could be yeah for sure like yeah. obviously I, maybe some minor tweaks but more or less it's it's pretty much a marketing strategy pretty much plug and play that's yeah plug it's and pretty play. much plug and play yeah it's and, and then it's ca- the the consulting is the one that's catered to like you know explaining how that works in relationship to a a client which is a different client than someone's buy- that's buying a coffee exactly exactly yeah. yeah yeah so so for me it's like i focus on this because i feel like this is the biggest opportunity right now being able to you know sustainably source trees and create wood products out of mm-hmm. them um and tell that story um but yeah you know from you know yeah that's so for me, it's like, that's, that's what we do for clients. It's like we help install and build marketing systems into their companies. Um, but yeah, I mean, to go back to what Tyler said before, it's like, yeah, man, I've where, where I'm headed, there's, I'm, I'm leaving that open mm. but right now. My, my focus is like, yeah, helping, helping folks grow and scale their businesses. So when a customer comes to you and you're going to essentially help them through this, this marketing path and lead generation. What part of that do you own rather than outsource? Like, um, are you essentially creating a system of outsourced people that you're able to feed them and channel them through to get to their end goal? Or like, what do you own in house um, versus outsourcing? Yeah, so um, in house, we create the strategy. We also set up the ads in house. We also set up their content in house. Um, and we, you know, design websites and logos in house. The part that we do outsource is when we recruit, screen, and train a virtual marketing assistant to be placed into their company. And then once they, so like, they pay us for setting up that whole system. And then once the system is done, then we release it to them. And then they have a virtual assistant that they own, they manage, they pay themselves, you know? So we had, we had somebody on recently um, who I think that he found, he w- he had family that was associated with the trades prior generations um second family that was associated with the trades and he realized that there was just an opportunity for marketing within the trades and that this like small sector of remodeling contractors really lacked this Mm -hmm. and he, he he found it to be um a challenging but potentially lucrative market sector for him to spend his time in um was part of your reason for going into this. I, I know that you said that you are, um, you have ties to this trade, but did you see this sector of woodworking and smaller, um, whether it be remodeling or um, people working with their hands really needed help with the marketing? Like was from a, from a business perspective where you like, yeah, this is in dire need of, of somebody to be able to help these people learn how to market properly and become more efficient business owners? Yeah. So when I first got into it, one of the things that I did was I contacted 50 different companies and I asked them, what's your number one challenge? (coughs) And then I had people that would hang up on me or curse me out because then they'd Google me and they'd be like, who the hell are you? And then other people would spend 90 minutes talking on the phone with me. And uh, they'd say, why, why are you reaching out to me? I said, because I'm looking to start a new business. And um, based off of solving the problems that 
most people have. And most people said marketing and advertising was a problem. And I said, whoever, whatever the, the biggest problem was, I was going to start a business around that. And that's what I did. And so I just kind of, I kind of, I went off of data and I went off of, uh, just what people told me. And even that's then, go ahead. No, I was gonna say that's so interesting. Like, and, it, and it's so different and I'm, I, I can only speak for myself, but like, that's so different than from what, why I started my business. Mm -hmm. You know, I started my business because it's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Not, not because a hundred people told me that they needed, you know, a specific type of home where yeah. I, I'm, as you're saying it out loud, I'm like, I'm playing the scenario out in my head where it's like, if I were to talk to a thousand people and ask, mm -hmm. Hey, what's the number one thing that, that is an issue in terms of like building a home or buying a home. Yeah. And it, you know, that, that whatever that issue is would be completely unrelated to it, to my business. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and I know, and, and not only that, but like surveying that many people, you know, where the, the average t talking about like an average home, you know, most yeah. homeowners just want a home. They don't care about the architectural yeah. design. Like they just want a safe, reliable home that they can move in and, and be done with. Not something that they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars designing it. They, they want to get in cost effectively. Yeah. And it's like, and I mean, that's probably it right there where it's like, oh, I just want a home that's cost effective. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, if I put all of my effort into figuring out how to build the most cost effective home, I remember mm -hmm. a, a professor in college um, was talking about, um, they were doing a study on building homes and they were building homes in increments of 14 feet because a 14 foot stud and framing material was more cost effective. Yeah. So they basically designed the home to utilize 14 foot material. So they weren't wasting and they were buying the most cost effective piece of lumber. And as I'm going, th um, this is literally how my brain is working right now. But it's like, if I put all my effort into figuring out how to build, what's the most cost effective home to build? And, I, and, and <laughs> my mind goes immediately to a, a style which I despise, which my <laughs> wife loves, but like the split ranch. Mm -hmm. Is she really? She it, there's a joke about it. She doesn't love them. Like her mm -hmm. grandparents had one, so she thought it was like she like we, I just I give her a hard time about it. But every time I see one, I take a picture. I'm like, look at this beautiful home. <laughs> but it's like that's what that they did. They they said, hey, if we build these, you know, split ranch homes, it's like it's more cost effective to build a knee wall and then a first floor on top of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. My, my, so my, they're basically like not the way that you're building. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our homes are definitely not cost effective. <laughs> <laughs> they're beautiful, but not the most cost effective way to have a roof over your head. Yeah. And I and I guess this is a great uh, Ted Ted Benson is a is a great example. He builds these beautiful custom homes that typically have timber framing, but then he's got this other company called Unity Homes which basically mm -hmm. he takes everything he learns in the custom world and figures out what, what processes and things that he can put in place to make a more cost effective home. And yeah. he's got unity homes that are pumping out. Hey, here's a catalog of homes, pick one, we'll build it for you. And this is the price because they know it. Yeah. 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 yeah that, that, that maybe blew my mind for a second. Yeah. Just no, they, about they're... going, going into that with that approach. Which, which is interesting because up until that point, I'd always started businesses based off of like what I thought was better, but I mm -hmm. wanted to do something. I really wanted to do something different because I was at that time, I was so focused on stoked that I, like I had, I had hit a wall. Like I was, I hit a, a million dollars in revenue. It was like something that I wanted to do. I hit a million dollars in revenue and I was like, this this sucks. Like the way that I did this, I was like, maybe there's a different way of doing business in the, in the future. And what uh, sucked about it? Um, so I feel like what, you're not telling us something <laughs> like, what do you mean? What sucked about what? Like, do you just walked away from this business that you like basically created that looks yeah, super yeah, yeah. dope and yeah. it's like, and I'm, I'm going to start this like 
boots on the ground marketing company from nothing. Yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I'm sitting here like this. I don't know if this checks out. Like, I feel like there's something, so, something it, with style you know, that you're not telling us. Honestly, I well, <laughs> here, here's the thing: is like, I got tired of being the nonprofit guy that like always asked for money. You know, like I wanted to change the dynamics of my relationships with folks. This is a, is a very different thing as when you're a fundraiser and like you're grinding fundraising all the time. And I loved it. I loved working for Stoke, but the nonprofit model is flawed and broken. And I didn't like that. And so for me, I wanted to, I realized that there are other ways of helping people and it's not always fundraising and putting together programs. And so it, it wasn't, I, I, it, in the end, I was like, man, I'm like, I called it stripper hours, right? Like you, you got a salary, but like you put in so much time into this thing. Um, and it was hard to, it was hard to see past it because every, like you raised a million bucks and you're like, okay, gotta do it again. You know what I mean? And there was like, no, and like, you can never really afford to like get the talent that you need. And but was yeah, it that, rewarding at first. For sure, man. I had no kids. I was snowboarding all the time. I was like, yeah, it was great. I mean, I love, I still love it. And I have, I still sit on the board. I also sit on the board, some other organizations that I care about, but like, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was super rewarding. Do you feel that, do you feel that when you got into it, you got into it for those reasons, uh, and to give back and to help. And then once the business started to grow, you essentially were doing everything, but the things that were related to why you got into it in the first place. Thousand percent. Yeah. 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 My, my, my whole, my whole dynamic changed. I was like, I stopped seeing the kids, I stopped seeing the mentors that I was rec- like, it just every everything became a transaction. Mm. And I mean, that's hard. essentially what I think is the biggest struggle with most people in our industry is that they start a construction business, they start a woodworking business, they start a, a lumber processing business, because they love that aspect of it. And then once the business starts to grow, mm-hmm. the tools come off, they get into the office, they're worried about raising yeah. capital or making capital to support this business. And there's, they lose touch with everything that they got into it for in the first place. Yeah. So I, like it's, I think it's different with nonprofit, but I don't, I don't feel that it's that dissimilar from most people who start a business Yeah. for the sake of passion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You're, you agree. basically are pulled away from, in order to continue to grow, you're pulled away from everything that brought you that joy in the first place. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, it's tough to, it's tough to scale your business and maintain, um, all of those principles and values that really were the reason for starting it in the first place. So looking into your business now. Yeah. Do you find that there's going to be a way for you to grow it? I know that you started it for different reasons, but do you feel that Mm -hmm. there's, you said that you, you, you right now it's gratifying work for you and that you're helping people. Do you feel that there's a way to grow this business in a way that's going to maintain that gratification, um, that you have right now for the business? Yeah. So one of the things that I did differently at least this time around was I started hiring better talent (laughs) and Mm -hmm. so that it's not just me doing everything. And so I was drained when I was on every coaching call, but now I'm like not. And I was drained when I was responsible for everything, but you know, I was able to put people in place. And so as I grow this, I, I think it's just more about, making sure that I can stay focused on delivering what I say I'm going to deliver to folks 
and having the resources in place to deliver that, who are the best at what they're, who are the best in, in those positions? Because I came from this nonprofit background, like I would, people, everybody had like four jobs and, you know, I realized that like, not everybody's like us potentially that can do multiple things. People need roles. And so, you know, with this time around, like, yeah, I have, you know, a growth specialist, a salesperson, a customer success person. I'm like, even if, even if they have to stay focused and part-time for that role until they can graduate into full-time, but like trying to, trying to document systems and processes a lot more, that's, you know, I, I, with, with the nonprofit, I couldn't, I couldn't, I, there was no way that I could do everything until I started hiring people for those positions. So that's, that's one of the things that I'm doing now is just like having distinct roles and responsibilities and just over communicating. That's probably the best, you know, Nick and I just recorded a podcast, um, with regard to all of these things and the struggle, the struggle with doing so. Um, and obviously you haven't heard the podcast because it was 50 minutes ago. Um, (laughs) but essentially he wanted to grow his business and had to put people in place. And at this point, a few years later, um, he's struggling with having pulled back um, and losing touch with people whose boots are on the ground and realizing that they weren't happy with certain things um, and that they weren't doing things the way that he felt necessarily had to be done and where the disconnect was and where things went wrong and how he's realizing that with growth and putting people in place, um, there's still potential issues and like how how to navigate putting people in place while still feeling as though you're part of that process and you're part of that team um and not creating any sort of resentment with the people who are doing the work and boots on the ground that feel as though you may be disconnected and just you know putting people in positions and then stepping back and like wiping your hands clean, absolving you of responsibility of the business. Yeah. And then you find if you try to dip out and give people responsibility and next thing you know, you like check your credit card and you've been running, you know what I mean? Like all these things happen because you tried to empower somebody. Um, Yeah. It's hard, man. It's really, really, it's really, really, really hard. Um, and, you know, it de- also to depending on your personality type, you know, for me, I'm, you know, creative visionary type person, I often need a, you know, type A organizational person to partner with. <laughs> That's as, exactly as, it. As my number two, like, it's hard for me. Yeah, it's that's exactly, that's exactly the situation. And for a long time, it was just me building. Mm -hmm. and you know and we did just fine but there was no there was no organization or sops or any of that and you know and until you just said that i don't think i realized that it was when we put all of that into place that people started kind of falling off or 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 jumping off the train where it's like whoa like you know now you're measuring how good i am at my job like mm. yeah tyler does your watch tell you to stand up right now I can see the little arrow. <laughs> yeah. I never knew what that was until my, <laughs> my wife and daughter were like, did you get your stand hours for today? And I was like, what's that mean? They're like, I want you to stand up like a minute every. So-. And I was like, I never even noticed. I was just dismiss it. That's funny. Uh, I saw the blue like shine out of the, the corner. Um, <laughs> but it, it that's yeah, exactly what it was. Went up at the same time too. <laughs> really? That's, yeah. It must just go out to everyone at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You just see like the whole office stand Apple up at one time. the whole entire world. Yeah. Like, um, but it, that's exactly it. It's like I balance, like I balance really well with someone that's type A and, and super organized. I'm, I'm sporadic. Like I can come into a, a a room and and fuck shit up. Like I'm just gonna <laughs> be all over the place. Like make these crazy like suggestions and 
And then I leave and they're like, all right, let's clean that up. Like, yeah, Nick didn't really mean that he wanted to build a house on the moon. Let's start <laughs> with the one on the earth. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that like we we operate so much better uh, as a business with with that like yin yang. So, yeah, yeah. Tyler, do you have that person? No, myself. No. I just yeah. like stay small enough that I can manage it. This is the same thing Nick and I were just talking about where it's like the smaller scale lends itself to less of a necessity for that. It's, it's just far more manageable and there still are mistakes and there's still miscommunications, but not, not having so many cooks in the kitchen lends itself to less, less hecticness, less mistake there's less of a need to over communicate everything. Um, mm -hmm. so it makes it, it makes it easier, um, for sure. And I think that the more that you do things, you do develop those systems and processes that make it easier. Um, and I, I just find a happy spot for myself where I can maximize my profit based on the lower volume of what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that serves, me well uh it serves my personality well it serves my family well and everything else and i just understand my capacity there and if i start or attempt to break out of that mm -hmm. um it usually it's so crazy that i don't realize it until i'm just so overwhelmed and i'm like what am i doing yeah um so i just make a make a concerted effort to remain as lean as possible and not overwhelm myself um just because i know i know my limits and i know my personality type mm -hmm. uh, how do you balance that with like the need slash desire to like grow progress as a person is is it like a this kind of push pull you know or is it like you've you've realized like this is the type of person type of business that you want to run so my initially my my construction business um it never really grew to be huge it was like two people working for me myself some subs uh i would always say like doing one and a half jobs at a time mm -hmm. um and i found a lot of self-worth in my business in my product and then it got to a point where it was just creating too much strife, strife for me financially, mm -hmm. mentally. Um, and I scaled back and really focused on making money through uh, a lower overhead and reduced mistakes and efficiencies. Yes. And then I, I found growth to be subjective like i'm not necessarily looking at numbers as far as growth goes sales volume but but increasing profit by getting jobs done quicker or changing the way that my business operates or yeah. reducing my overhead to be more profitable and then putting more time into stuff like i just heard this recently but like people aren't meant to do the same thing for their entire lives and i always yeah. Like I enjoy what I'm doing, but it doesn't necessarily serve me the same way that it did 10, 15 years ago. So yeah. I, I do the podcast. I do a little bit of consulting. Um, mm -hmm. I do a, a separate podcast that's affiliated with this. And I find that to help more with personal growth and inventorying what I'm doing on a daily, weekly basis. Yeah. Um, and then I just, I really try and hone my craft and do the best that I can do on my projects. I'm not um, really looking to grow my business from a sales volume perspective. Gotcha. Um, so I've yeah. somewhat diversified the way that I'm making money. So I'm making more money, but I'm, I'm not putting all of those eggs in the construction basket. Yeah. 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 You know, it, um, I, I, that thing that you just said is like, people aren't meant to work do the same thing. That's literally how I felt. And I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. And this might relate to somebody. I met this guy, he was a 35 year founder, or 30 year founder of a nonprofit, or 40 year founder. And he invited me to his like 40 year anniversary gala. And so he's at 60 at the time, right. And 
and he started it with his friends. It was a theater company in Brooklyn where I used to live in. Uh, and, and they showed pictures from like 40 years ago on the screen, like slideshow style. And I'm looking at him as a young person. And then I'm seeing him walk around the gala saying hi to people in a suit, much, much older. And I said to myself, Oh, I'm never going to be the 30, 40 year founder of a nonprofit. I was like, I was like to do the same thing over and over and over again. Mm. I was like, I, I never want to do that. I was like, I, I had other ideas and I had other things that I wanted to do. And I was listening to an audio book yesterday and it talked about the number of days that we have 20 for men. It's 27,740 days. You multiply your age times 365 you subtract that from the 27740 that's how many days you're supposed to have left on this earth alive and i was like how many people here are like not doing the thing that they truly wanted to do and i kind of got into a space where i'm just like yeah i just want to do the things that i really want to do have fun love travel be with my family and that vehicle that I was that I had started with isn't going to get me to where I need to be, you know. So, damn, um, I only have fourteen thousand days left. It's wild, right? Does that does that like give you motivation to get up and do stuff? It's so. Look, I lost my dad a year and a half ago, and uh, and my, I just found out my mom was in the hospital like a week ago and it kind of gave me like a shock. And, um, what do you get news via like messenger pigeon? I feel like you should have found out about that sooner. <laughs> well, my mom is an immigrant mom who doesn't tell her kids anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like white moms are probably different. They probably over communicate, but like Caribbean immigrant moms don't tell their kids anything. Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> they, yeah, they don't, they don't tell their kids anything. And so, uh, so for me, it's like, yeah, it's, it's on my mind. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's on my mind. You know? I know th different things motivate people differently. And yeah. sometimes I'll see stuff on that where it's like, you have X amount of hours in a day and I get kind of hyped up about it. And then yeah. I'm just like, I'm kind of tired this morning. And I yeah. like, I'm yeah. not going to think about that that yeah. thing I saw on the internet where it's like, you have so many minutes in a day. Yeah. 22, I, yeah. Yeah. It, it's also tough. I think people relate to things differently, but where yeah. you think like, I think of how much time I potentially have left. And I'm like, that just gives me anxiety to think about. And yes. for years, like for years, I tried to manage or be able to cope with like life is, like there's a definite end to it and it's going to happen. You don't know when it's going to happen. And I tried to like make sense of that and rationalize that. And it just gave, it gave me so much anxiety that finally I was like, I'm just not going to think about it. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to cope with that. I can't process there. I cannot rationally make sense of this or like make sense of life or what it's about. And that there's no, like, for me, there's no, uh, like religious theory that's going to make me feel any better about that so it's like i just don't think about that and i try and go through each day and do what i have to do and like yeah. every every night i think about what i could do differently if i want to spend more time with my kids and it's it's not a, every single day that i'm sitting down thinking about this but i i try not intentionally try not to think about <clears throat> like how much time I may or may not have left to spend in life to spend with loved ones and everyone else. And that's actually what gets me through most days, which I feel like would be counterintuitive to what most people think where they're like, I only have this much time left. That's going to get up and get me moving. For me, that would like paralyze me. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I get it. No, for sure. which I think is is different than most people. I'm more of the mindset where I'm like, I just don't want to think about it. And I want to get up and have energy and do what I have to do every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick, what about you? I I, I feel I, like Nick 
knows Nick has a countdown. Like he knows. I don't, <laughs> I don't, but I might start one. I actually saw uh, there's a company that does like uh, it's like weeks or something like that. It's like a big poster and every week. Yeah, it's for like, Memento Mori. Yeah, and you fill in each week, uh, and it's really interesting. Um, I don't think it paralyzes me. I think I oftentimes use it to remind myself um, that when when I am in a tough spot or in a challenging time in my life, that you know the reality is is that life is much greater and there's an end to it. Mm -hmm. uh and not in the sense that like oh whatever like i don't have to put up with this for much longer i'll I'll die so this is i'll go away more just like this isn't the the important side of it um yeah yeah, and you know and i and i've definitely preached that on this podcast where it's like listen like at the end of the day if you know i fail and i lose money and i have to put the bit like shut the business down and all that like all of that sucks and it's anxiety It, it can create immense anxiety but the reality is is like okay, like, Mm -hmm. then I shut the business down, I lose my house, I lose my car, and I start over. And I and and the fun part is, is that now I have a head start. Because I've done it before. Yeah. And you know, and people are like, Well, where would you live? It's like, I don't know, my mother in law's house or something. I'm not saying I want to live there. Yeah, yeah, by any means. But the reality is, is like, my life doesn't end if I fail in business. Mm. And I say that out loud and I, and I think about it a lot because, you know, when I, when I do cross that path of feeling like I could fail, it, 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 that is what, you know, um, you know, immobilizes me. Yeah. And that, that's funny that you say that. Cause I'm thinking of the same thing now. So the other day I don't, Oh, so I was driving Selby. Who's my oldest, who's 10 and her, uh, one of her friends who's a grade older than her, she's 11. So they're in fifth and sixth grade. And they were talking about what colleges they want to go to. And then I was sitting there and I'm like, I don't even know why they're talking about this. Like it's forever away. And then I was like, wait, Selby's in fifth grade. So essentially that's like seven more years until she's a senior. She'll be going into college in eight years. And I'm like, I'm not right now financially ready to pay what the cost of college will be for my kids in like seven or like, I've never thought about it. It's like seven or eight years is nothing, right. nothing at all. And then I'm like, so I, I need to stay, start okay. saving more money for college, this and that. <laughs> and it's just like stressing me out oh, and like, man. like helping me less instead of being like, okay, we're in a decent position right now. Let's keep moving forward day to day see where we stand and who knows what's going to happen in two years three years four years like i'm not going to say that i'm ignorant to what needs to happen like i want to be aware of it but you have to realize that like some some people that pressure does not motivate them or help them Mm -hmm. at all and i feel that i'm one of those people like that'll just keep me up at night and then make me stressed out all day and i won't be focused and i won't Mm -hmm. be I won't yeah. make like any progress in life because I'll just be sitting there like Selby's going to college in eight years and I don't have four hundred thousand dollars put away in the bank for <laughs> 400, her right now. Four hundred? Where's she yeah. going? Dude, uh, my my it's, uncle it's just yeah, it's like man. like my uncle was sending his one daughter to Villanova and it's like ninety grand a year right now. What? Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. I feel like even like most schools are like sixty grand a year right now baseline 45 50 000. yeah it's it's expensive yeah so you keep having kids nick you got four <laughs> nick's doing the math right now look at them i'm like trying to figure out how much money you got to save per day for that so if we got wow. four hundred thousand dollars right that's a lot of money and then divided by 2900 <clears throat> days right you got to save an extra 140 bucks a day right <laughs> a day i know save a day save. i know dude i'm telling you wow. so that wild. that crossed my mind the other day and was like a huge eye opener because i'm like my daughter's 10 and i'm like oh that's so long like why are you even thinking about this and then i was like geez like seven she's she's young for her grade so she'll end up going to college when she's 17 and i was that's like 50 grand a year you seven seven years 50 grand just like 
banking 50 grand just to in eight years to have 400. Yeah. Gap oh, year. <laughs> Trade school. <laughs> yeah. I, I do wonder. I mean, maybe. I mean, I do wonder that about my kid. God, now I got to think about it. Well, I was also there was another another one where it's like inflation is basically every all the money that you have and that you have saved inflation is devaluing that where mm. it's like right if you had a million dollars in the bank however long ago and you oh, have a yeah, million yeah, dollars yeah, in the yeah. bank now it's not yeah. worth like the same amount and they're like yeah so most people are going to run out of money by the time they retire because they're saving for a certain amount and then like with inflation that's going to be worth so much less and i'm just like i need to get off the internet right now because my algorithm <laughs> yeah. is Your just algorithm, yeah, crap yeah. into me <laughs> that's depending like, on who you are you're going to feel like a failure like yeah. you know, all those all those real estate guys they're uh, oh my if, god if, if you're in that <laughs> it's like why don't i have a jet yeah why don't you because you got four kids that's yeah why. that is true but um it is tough uh so how many people do you have as far as clients go right now so right now i'm probably close to like 20 people that i'm coaching that i'm helping and work with and they we go we have like a six month program so mm -hmm. we're, we have people that were like constantly coming in and out um <clears throat> which i'm pretty excited about um but yeah no it's uh it's it's a lot of fun especially when like you see people they hit like their first like 30 to 50k month they're like oh my god like they you could start to see their eyes change a little bit mm. they start to see what's possible and one of the things that i did was i i i uh, i wanted to challenge myself to see like all right can i help anybody with the smallest amount of things possible and it, I created this thing called the the 10k to 15 day challenge so just to bring in an extra 10k um and uh and so that that's been going well um just to help people see what's possible show them what's possible um like last month there's a guy he brought in in 15 days he brought in about 100 grand worth of work um in 15 days and he was like uh i only had one week's worth of work left and a bunch of bills and this basically saved my year you know and so so without giving away all your secrets like what do you what would you attribute that to so i'm a big believer in personal branding and so the best vehicle for personal branding is leveraging your personal facebook page mm. right now it's not instagram it's your personal facebook page and your personal Facebook page allows you to connect. So the, the premise is like, if you have X amount of followers on Instagram, only a small percentage of them actually see your content. But if we're friends on our personal Facebook page, it's like this dual connection. It's not like you follow me, I don't follow you. Oh, uh, right. So you have 5,000 friends that you can have. Imagine if you had 5,000 friends on Facebook that were your ideal customers. People that, all these people that all, they wanted custom homes, they wanted renovated homes. They, mm. like all of your ideal customers locally. And so hold, let me just, so this is my personal Facebook. No, I'm not, am I creating another, am I creating a, a Nick Schiffer fan page? No, it's my personal Nick like- Nick Schiffer fan page. Fan page. <laughs> how how, how self-centered can I be? This is the page. <laughs> Where yeah, my connected. wife is tagged as my wife and exactly your your the your high school friends your aunts like all of those people and is this uh, maybe i'm jumping ahead but is this the same strategy that you would like like what about linkedin you can literally i haven't tested it out on linkedin but you can literally do the same thing on linkedin yeah but but the the linkedin i, I haven't really delved into linkedin too much lately but with, with personal Facebook page, it's the, the, the concept is 80%. Just imagine your personal Facebook page is like a net, you know, a TV show, 80% mm. content, 20% commercials, right? 80% okay. show entertaining. Mm -hmm. So it's like you, your life, what you're doing. And then 20 houses for sale. 
Yeah. And then for twenty percent, buy was, this house. Buy this house. Get a get an estimate. So or get a quote. Get it. So design. are you? you you, you say 5,000, is that the maximum amount of connections you can have on Facebook? You can actually have more followers than that, but like people that you're actually friends, friends. they friend you, you friend them 5,000. Okay. So I wonder how many I have, I, how I, can you find out? I think you can go right to, I'm going to You just go to your friends page. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, all right. Am I changing my strategy to, instead of, you know, becoming friends with everyone I want to be friends with now I'm, I'm approaching this as a business. And I'm looking, I just looked exactly. up forward exactly. slash Nick Schiffer. And that's not me. It's some kid from San Jose on a motorcycle. So let's, I only have 604 friends. I'm going to look up my mom. I feel like I should be my mom's I have, page that I have her post crap on. I have 1.5. Yeah. My mom has 4.6 thousand friends. I need to have my mom <laughs> posting stuff. Hold up. Your mom has 4.6 thousand friends. Yeah. Old people love Facebook. Yeah, oh, they do. I'm not even she, dude, I, just need, aren't I don't they even your need audience? to post. Aren't your boomers your audience? I don't. I mean, it's got to be better than my own audience, which is only 600 people. Boomers have a lot of money. <laughs> they love Facebook too. They so, am, all right. So that's what I was going to ask: is how am I built? Like, am I? So look, you're gonna you're gonna put a picture of your so house. I'm interested in this. Put it one. I'll ask my mom what she's going to charge you to post about Nick Schiffer on her <laughs> Facebook page. <laughs> So what you could do is like, so one of the things that I would do is I just, I like make sure that your profile picture is like picture of you or you and your wife or your family or whatever, mm -hmm. but just like you smiling. And then your header background is like picture of a home. Okay. And then your bio is like dad, husband, custom home builder, builder of dreams, whatever. Right. Okay. And then your content on a daily basis, if you want to, and you really just kind of build an audience around the idea that like you're a custom home builder in your area, drop into groups, drop into, uh, yeah, drop into groups, drop into, um, different communities, mm. um, friending people, you know how you you know how there's like friends of people that that you don't know but you have like 20 mutual friends with yeah those people need to be your friends okay and then like what a, what a content idea that i would do is go around to all the houses like visit the houses that you've built mm -hmm. as they're you know people are lived in them just like literally visit them take selfies with you and your clients and the homes and do like little tours and then just post that. She's like, Oh, I'm just going back to see how my houses have been holding up. And then you do that and then put out content, educating people on like, um, on the process of building a cut because everybody would love a custom home, but nobody knows the process, which kind of goes back to what we talked about in terms of like content creation is that you need some pillar content. Yeah. And so, and I the understand pillar, the premise behind that, Th this whole Facebook thing is blo like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blowing my mind. Cause but, I, I, I've always kept it separate and you, you know, I, I've, no, no, you're, you're going to make, you're, you're going to make a couple million just with this strategy. I'm serious. Like this is the, the one of the best under resource people are like, you sure not my Facebook business page? I'm like, no, the mm. hack is your personal Facebook page. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, like it, and I'm, I'm looking at it now and I, mm -hmm. I haven't been on my Facebook in a very long time. And I'm realizing that my personal Instagram page, which is mm -hmm. what I, where I promote my consulting and things like that are repopulating on my personal Facebook page, yeah. which is fine. Like that's a source of, of revenue. But the reality is, is like, I need to be promoting my big business. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, that's what I would do. So the, and the, the pillar content that you need are like, if you could do, you know, an about us and then just put out stuff, educating people, educating people on the whole entire process. 
Mm. It's like, all right, you would like to buy a, a custom home. Here's the first thing you need to know. You need to do A, B, and C. And then the next piece of content is C, you know, D, E, and F, right? And you just walk people through and you just let them know. And then you show them inside the homes that you've been building. And you just kind of build this sort of aspirational sort of content strategy. I mean, Nick the same more, strategy Nick works. More, Nick needs more friends on Facebook. That's a problem. Uh, I'm I'm working on it. You only have yeah, it's, it'll be easy. I'm just yeah. I don't I don't add anyone, and I also don't accept anyone unless I yeah. know you or have hung out with you. Yeah, that's a very that's a that's an antiquated uh, method of, of oh, leveraging goodness. Facebook. Damn. And the, the best part about it, honestly, is it is very organic. So we're not asking you to like the, the strategy that I tell people to do is like, I don't want you to be posting buy this house, buy this house. Like you're not doing that. You just be yourself. Mm -hmm. And then, um, what I, I call it the, um, the infomercial strategy is that like you'll post uh you'll post that night i tell clients this so i'll give your audience a gift <laughs> so post that night so just like that's you when know, everyone's on facebook yes but Unless it's like info work. infomercial style everybody's yeah. minds are weak at night so then you <laughs> i mean how that often is that is when i instagram shop is like exactly at exactly night, like, fine uh, i will wear those shorts kevin hart has them <laughs> then i will have them too I, yeah <laughs> so there's this girl in high school she was older than us but she used to um like go on those infomercial or um like home shopping network night late at night she may or may not have indulged in recreational drugs before doing so. Um, and she told us the story one time that she like came home one day to a giant like warrior sword that was wow. on her porch steps in a box and she opened it up. And like at that moment re was the first time that she recalled sitting in bed and ordering this like warrior sword off of home shopping network but like didn't remember it <laughs> until it came i also did the same thing a couple of weeks ago not recreational drugs but like ordered two pairs of shoes and they both came in the wrong size and i was like nah i definitely ordered them the wrong size that's what happens when i'm like mm. half falling asleep ordering stuff in bed dude li living in the city it's so funny like when i I walk down the block to grab my truck every, every day. Someone orders food, take out, it gets dropped off on their porch. And then the next morning I walk by at five in the morning, it's just sitting there. Still there. Just like, <laughs> it's like, oh, you went home drunk, hungry yeah. and went to sleep. And it's like about Taco it. Bell with like a soda and a straw balancing on the top of the cup. Yeah. <laughs> like, that shit's been there since midnight. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, um, I'm not, I'm definitely not a huge facebook user but it makes sense i i also feel that um instagram from like a business marketing algorithm perspective uh it is like less and less as mm -hmm. far as views and what you're putting out i mean i guess unless you're just like hitting stride with the algorithm yeah in yeah. general um, i think that's what i mean brad talks about linkedin he he gets a ton of business on linkedin and it's a same strategy as um, Facebook. I think you can have 30,000 connections or something like that on LinkedIn. On it's, LinkedIn, yeah. It's pretty high. But okay. um, but he's like, it's it, you're you're just talking at a different level. It's, you know, pro to pro. You yeah, know, yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, yeah. a finance guy looking at like in, you know, there's a very like professional environment there. So when mm -hmm, someone comes mm -hmm. in and is like, hey, we build homes, it's like, oh, cool. You're, you're professional and you build homes. Yeah. So yeah. it's, you know. Yeah, it's those Facebook, Instagram. I mean, Facebook and LinkedIn are two areas that I'm, I'm putting less than 2% effort into. And yeah, it's yeah. You know, the reality yeah. is, it's like it should be greater than that. Yeah, Facebook personal is the uh, I've been I've been talking about it for a while. And it it's and I didn't even come up with the strategy. I, I mean, I learned it. But mortgage guys, yeah, kill it, crush it. Insurance, crush yeah. it like, on Facebook because it's like, it's something that everybody yeah, needs you're right. and everybody's on Facebook mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and it's really, it's like, 
Some people post motivational, some people post workout stuff, some people talk about mental health, some people mm -hmm. talk about, you know what I mean? But then it's all infused with their business. Yeah. And the reality is, is like if I every time I log in and Bill Smith is posting about insurance and then I need a new insurance guy, I'm like, you know what? I'll reach out to Bill. It's the accident injury attorney billboard strategy. Morgan and Morgan. Dude, there, I also went to high school with the kid who's one of those attorneys now, and I didn't know it. And I drove past his building, and I was like, I wonder if that's him. And I looked it up online, and it's like, if you look up his website, it's him, and he's got on basically a pinstripe suit, and he's like smoking a cigar, and he's like, you're innocent until proven guilty. And I'm like, this is this is the most cringe worthy thing I've ever seen in my whole life. I know and they are. I mean, there's a guy. I think it's Morgan Morgan is who, who is around here, and they're huge. But mm -hmm. it's this one old guy that's always on the billboard, and it's like, and he, it's a straight up like his head photoshopped on some ripped dude laying on a beach, <laughs> and and then he's like, then he'll photoshop himself as Santa. Like it's just, and but that's the first person I think of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's usually it's again, it's like I had a, I had a client. She is completely crushing it. She's a mom of three using this and she does, she and her husband do built, uh, built-ins mm -hmm. in homes. And she's in like Westchester County, Connecticut area. Mm. And, uh, she talks about homeschooling, hockey, woodworking. That's it. Like, yeah. and People recognize her on the street now. They like they. It's it's just kind of like this very very, you know, casual like it's casual marketing by leverage. And so, it part of this strategy means that you got to friend people that you don't know. Yeah, and that's scary for folks. So but, what what are you using to market your business? I know I'm you said the content. podcast. Yeah. The, the, so if I look back at like my best clients come from my podcast. So, you know, I just do more podcasts and I, 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 I give. What are you doing specifically with the podcast or are you just doing the podcast? I'm doing specifically with the podcast. I'm interviewing folks and then I do a consultation at the end. Um, and then I take. I take the, the, the consultations and then I break those out. And then I, I, I basically, you know, the whole Alex Hormozzi, just give out your best shit. Like yeah. just, just, that's all I do. I, dude, I will I, just real quickly. He is insane, like in, insane in so many great ways. Like yeah. listening to that dude talk about business, he breaks it down in a way that I'm like, how can I be, how, how was I so stupid? <laughs> I'm like you, you it's like he just sits there and he just he he outlines it so simply Simpsons. and and it's like it's so good. If you guys so don't good. know who Alex Hermosi is, anyone that's listening, you got to look him up. Um yeah. 100 million dollar leads, 100 yeah. million dollar offers, yeah. I just I I just reread leads and I just read offers last week and it's like man, like you so it just makes so so much sense. So much sense, yeah. yeah. Um but yeah, I love his content strategy. He's like, I'm just going to give everything away for free. I don't need to put it. Yeah, I mean, on. there's YouTube. Everybody can look up stuff on YouTube. Yeah. You know, it's like right. there's, you might as well, you might as well be the person that helps somebody else. Yeah, he's like, so, give it away for free and sell the implementation. And it's like, exactly that's ultimately what it is. It's like, I can give away a bunch of stuff for free. And then someone's like, you know what? I, I, I've read it. I've listened to it. I've done it. And I just want you to do it. Great. Yeah. 50K. Got it. Yeah, yeah we'll do it. Where are these people yeah. coming up with all this stuff? Like I just looked him up online. He's like a huge meathead. Do you think they're just like <laughs> getting most of this information from other people and then like for some I, reason I think they a have lot a of personality people, to No, I think a lot of people are, but it I do not think Alex is is that way. No. So I, I Alex Alex kind of came from the digital marketing world and he has had the biggest mentors that he's invested in and he mm -hmm. often talks about, but, um, for him, he just implemented his own stuff, got his own results, came up with his own strategies. And then that's what he's. The short story is he was like dead broke and convinced some gym to let them him 
come there and help market and, and he guaranteed that he could get more people to sign up for the gym and like sure man whatever you want and the dude like slept in the back of the gym and basically just like figured out how to manipulate facebook ads to increase um you know Sale. people sales yeah. And he took that and he then like tra literally drove around the country and did this in a bunch of gyms and, and we're blowing these gyms up, like just yeah. insane amount of, of signups to the point where, I mean, he tells this whole story in his book, but to the point where he finally realized he could just license this and just give them the strategy. It's like here, yeah. like instead of me, instead of me flying out there and doing all this, like just do it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And Damn. hundred million dollar net worth. It's, it, it's yeah. like, it, just how he did how he did it um, is so interesting, uh, and he ended up he's super smart. He's so smart. Yeah, he's he's, so smart. He, and he speaks and his wife and his wife too. His, his oh, business she, partner. Yeah, he's, she's, she's equally as smart, if not smarter. She's smart as shit. Yeah, yeah. They they yeah. they're very yin and yang too. Where she's like she's all people, and he's all like the other side of it. Yeah, nerdy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I cool. cut you off there when we were talking about Hermosi, but. No, just no. looking at all these pictures of him just jacked up. I mean, he's a he's, he's a big dude. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah he's a, he's yeah. a solid. He, <laughs> it's funny because he also gives fitness advice, which I love because he's like, guys, it's pretty simple. Just if you want to lose weight, be in a calorie deficit. I eat <laughs> shit. I eat cake. I eat dessert. I'll eat stuff from a gas station. It doesn't matter. I just make yeah. sure I don't over consume calories. All yeah. these fitness influencers out there telling you anything else that you need to eat and eat an avocado between the hours of seven fifty and eight o'clock in the morning. To, for, it's like, he's like, forget it. And he just boils yeah. it down to like simple shit. And he, he's also like, he's like, I eat anything I want. He goes, as long as I have my 140 grams of protein. Like yeah. that's yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's like, hit the protein, everything else. I backfill with whatever I want. Cookies. Yeah, sure. <laughs> he goes, I have dessert every night. Yeah. Nah, he's he's a he's a cool dude. He's a good one to follow. Just from, he's a he's a very good one to follow. Yeah, just to to learn it. Um, cool. So, yeah. do you have an editor edit chop it chop this up? Like how how's it, how long is this supposed we, to go? No, we leave it we leave it raw, man. It's, it's <laughs> that's it's, it. Yeah, we we we. I mean, we'll even include this little tidbit explaining that's how we do it. <laughs> um, no, it's usually yeah, we're we're an hour and a half, so it's usually between an hour and a half and two hours. Okay. Um, and then we'll cut up some clips and share them with you, so you can cross promote. Yeah, that'd be fun. That'd um, be fun. but well, let I, me know. I know. Let me know if there's anything else that you know you guys need or want, or if you have ways that for us to collaborate. Um, I mean, I'd, dude, lo I'd love to collaborate. I mean, I know you guys do consulting. I don't know what kind of what kind of consulting do you do? Um, most of our stuff is we, we do small, like one hour calls, uh, in, like yeah. at, individually. Um, and then okay. I host a couple events a year. Um, with Brad, right? With Brad, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, so that that was something that we've been testing out and 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 seems to be growing some pretty strong legs. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm sure that will grow kind of in, into its own animal, but no, I, 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 I think I speak for both of us. Like this was a really interesting conversation. I, I would, you know, definitely welcome the opportunity to keep this relationship going. Same, um, same, yeah, no, I like, I like your guys's vibe and style and I appreciate, uh, you know, some of the, the vulnerability and, you know, the honesty and the rawness yeah. behind you know, behind the podcast, but yeah, I'd love, I'd love to figure out how to, um, how to collaborate. I, I I'll, I'll have some ideas that I'll kick around. Let's do but, it. I, um, I'll send out an email. So you have our direct emails right after this and then we'll, we'll stay okay. in touch. Okay, cool. Uh, how do you say your you. last name? La Rosalier. Oh, La Rosalier. I feel like that's how it, no. that's how it looks. Yeah. 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 <laughs> La Rosalier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, that that's cool. that's not uh i feel like that's um that checks out super french it's Steve. not it's not as as <laughs> i feel like as as confusing as it appears to be yeah but at least i know now yeah uh, steve before you go what if someone wants to reach out to you and potentially work with you on the um the marketing side or or just get in touch what's the best way to do it uh instagram the la rosaliere um or buildagrowth.io cool all cool. right you guys heard it. And oh, thanks so much. I really appreciate you reaching out. Yeah, of course. We'll chat soon. Yeah, I appreciate right, your time, you. man. All right. Take care. Bye. Thanks. <sighs> Facebook. Dude, 
I mean, it makes complete sense. It does. I, I forget what the other thing. He blew my mind twice on that podcast. And it's like, and both of them, I'm like, man, I really feel like I should have known that. But the Facebook thing, like, it it just makes so much sense. If you get a friend request from Nick on Facebook. <laughs> in the next if you want to build a house, I am definitely going to friend you. Then you know what you know what's going on. I'm gonna go down a rabbit hole tonight of like how to find how to target people on Facebook to become their friend when they want to do particular things like build a house. Yeah, honestly, dude, I feel like so much of it is um, even, and I just I don't know. I don't. I think a lot of it is just getting the exposure and like exposure to certain areas. I know a lot of people spend a lot of time investing in local Facebook marketing groups and like my name gets passed around on there a lot. A lot of times it winds up not being my customer, but I think that if you have systems in place to vet those leads out. But also like if there's a hundred times, your name is being promoted a hundred times instead of just like 10. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like for me, I don't need the volume to be like, I don't want it actually Mm -hmm. um, because it's just, that's not where I feel my time is best spent. Um, But I think that if you are looking for exposure, that there definitely is a ton of value in like getting down locally um, with the area that you're building. Like Instagram is not local. and I, I think that people can find you, obviously. But I, I like if you want to be building in a specific area, there's much better ways and better uses of your time and energy that are way more um, like location specific um, than just like a generalized approach to marketing. And yeah. Facebook is like. Uh, at least from what I see in like those, those groups and everything, there's a ton of them for all different areas, all different things that you can get around and get, get involved with, um, with the community. It's just like the, the architect that we had on, who was like, yeah, I moved to that town because that's where I wanted to work. It's the same thing. It's, yeah. ju- it's just becoming more involved locally. Um, and then becoming more prominent. I love that. And, um, I mean, big thanks to him for sharing that insight and, and giving us the little nugget of posting at night when people are weak, which is hilarious, but so accurate. Yeah. It's like, sure. if I go back and look at any time I've ever shopped online for, you know, it's always like at the end of the day, I'm like, fine, I'll buy them. <laughs> like in the morning, like I might put them in my cart, but then I'm like, no, I don't need to be buying a pair of running shorts right now. Yeah. And then at the end of the night, it's like, I definitely need those. I deserve to this. Yeah. I deserve this. I was good today. Yeah. I'm not going to eat ice cream. I'm going to buy these shorts. <laughs> or maybe I'll eat ice cream in these shorts. Yes. I can't wait to eat ice cream in these shorts. <laughs> uh, well, as always, guys, appreciate you listening. Um, if you have not gotten your t-shirt, you will get it soon. Uh, we had a huge order. So that was a pre-sale. Uh, orders start going out at the end of October. Um, and we got some new stuff in the works, uh, which includes a custom USA made pencil, which we're excited to launch here in a couple weeks. So if you haven't done so already, please, please, please head over to iTunes, drop us a review, let us know how we're doing, and we will see you guys next week. I'm excited for my shirt. I have not sent you yours. <laughs> I, so I am sorry. <laughs> All right, guys and girls. Thank you. Women. See ya. Thank <laughs> you.